everyone, my name is Keegan and welcome to Christ Community Church. It's so good to see you here today. We still have a few minutes before our service begins, so until then, check out what's happening this week at CCC. Hey guys, if you're new to CCC, signups for the next Foundations Week in class are open. At Foundations, you will learn more about who we are, what we believe, and what it means to follow Jesus. Completing Foundations is also a prerequisite for making CCC your official church home by becoming a member. Today is the first day of a special two-week series called On Mission. All week long, we're going to be highlighting the amazing ministry work God is doing through CCC to overlooked places in West Africa, and we don't want you to miss any of it. On your way in, you are given an On Mission handout, which has the calendar of events for everything planned this week, so be sure to check that out. Later in our service, you will meet special guest Becky McCabe, the founder of Hands of Honor. Hands of Honor is a ministry that reaches and cares for teenage girls working in large West African cities who are mistreated and sometimes abused. Becky will be sharing some today in service, and then tonight, all women and girls aged 10 and up are invited to come to a free women's event to hear more of Becky's story. Sign up online. Our latest edition of The Hub magazine is now available for you. The Hub contains real stories of life transformation of people in our church. This is also a great resource for you to learn more about where God is leading CCC and what's happening in the next two months. Please pick up your free copy after service today. Service is about to begin. Be sure to check out cccomaha.info for more information about anything we've mentioned today.
is moving right here in our church, but beyond that, in places all across the world that we don't even know. And you know, that's through the great work of the gospel being spread to the least reached places. And I'm super encouraged by that because that's exactly what Jesus commissioned believers to do. In Matthew 28, 19, he told us to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He promised to be with us. And you, at being part of Christ Community Church, we're part of a much larger denomination. We're doing that. We're helping to bring the gospel to places all across the globe where people who don't know Jesus are hearing about him and coming to faith. And we we want to celebrate that. Today is week one of a two-week uh, special highlight called On Mission to Overlooked People. And for the next week and a half, this Sunday through next Sunday, we're going to be focusing on overlooked people in West Africa. We've got a great lineup of uh, speakers, and uh, I hope that your hearts are ready to open and just be filled up with encouragement as uh, we just learn about what God is doing. So we invite you now, we're going to sing some songs to stand up to your feet. And we are going to be just celebrating Jesus, and we want you to join in with us.
to see you here today. Like I said, we are going to be highlighting the great work that God is doing in and through us. And we're gonna start that off here in just a second. But before we do, I know there's some people around you that you haven't met before. So just go ahead right now and introduce yourself to one or two people. Uh, tell them hello. Tell them how glad you are to see them. And uh, we'll continue in just a moment. And then you can be seated. Well, hey, good morning. My name is Craig Walter. Uh, I am the missions pastor here at Christ Community Church. This is Ashley Haukus, uh, one of our amazing residents here at the church. Nice. She gets a little applause. Oh, gee, thanks. 
Well, hey, one of the things I know in my job as I talk to many of you uh, is that I realize that many of us have a very little knowledge or understanding of what our denomination uh, is doing around the world. You see, Christ Community Church, since we launched way back in 1921, has been part of this movement uh, that we call the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So for the next two weeks, we're actually, as we talk about on mission to overlook people, we are going to be celebrating what the Alliance and what God has been doing through Christ Community Church by taking faith and hope and compassion uh, to least reach peoples around the world. A story actually begins in 1921, uh, or actually, I'm sorry, back in the late 1880s uh, with a couple by the name of Albert and Maggie Simpson. Albert was this really, really successful pastor uh, in a large church in New York City, and he was making the equivalent of what would be like $110,000 a year today. They had a really nice home. They had prestige. They had this great ministry. But they felt like God was calling them to something else. They felt like God was calling them to leave their church and to start ministering to the poor and overlooked people in their city. Well, to do this, they had to move into a really small, cramped home. They had no income. They had no church. They had no job. And this led Maggie to ask Albert a couple simple questions. She said, Albert, where is this all going to lead? Is this going to be worth it? So this morning, in the next few minutes, uh, we're going to give you a partial answer to Maggie's question. This is going to be a really, really fast overview of the story that has resulted from their obedience. An overview of this movement that you and I at Christ Community Church get to be a part of called the Christian and Missionary Alliance. So let's go together. The Alliance movement in North America started with a single church in New York City called the Gospel Tabernacle which has grown to a network now in the U.S. of over 2,000 churches worshiping in 35 languages. In the last decade alone, those 2,000 churches baptized more than the entire Nebraska football stadium. In fact, they baptized over 122,000 people in the last decade. By faith in the late 1890s, Albert and Maggie launched what they called the Missionary Training Institute, which stands today as Nyack College in New York. And they had this dream to send missionaries to the least reached places around the globe. So we'll start our tour in Africa, where the first graduates were sent out as pioneer missionaries to the Congo. 20-year-old John Condit led this small team, but within two weeks of their arrival, he fell victim to malaria and died. Just a few months later, three of his colleagues returned home as well, so only one worker remained. Yet today, the Alliance churches in the Congo minister to more than a million believers. And throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, there are now more than 2.3 million believers worshiping Jesus in Alliance churches. In the country of Guinea, our workers help curb the spread of Ebola while providing compassionate care to its victims and their families. In the country of Gabon, the Bongolo Hospital presents the gospel to every single patient and every family member. And last year, through their ministry, more than 2,300 people came to Christ. In the country of Senegal, where CCC's newest missionaries, Michael and Amy Gilbert, are headed, people living on the streets because they're suffering from leprosy are getting help from Alliance workers. Some have been miraculously healed, and recently 15 have given their lives to Christ. In Burkina Faso, our Alliance workers are drilling wells, giving clean water to thousands while planting 46 new churches in recent years. And finally, in Mali, the country here at CCC that we love so much, in 2016, our Hospital for Women and Children celebrated 10 years of incredible ministry, having treated nearly 100,000 patients, delivering over 2,000 babies and conducting 8,000 surgeries, with hundreds coming to faith in Christ. So today and next Sunday, you're going to hear a lot more about our work in Mali. Moving to the Asia-Pacific region, by faith, a guy by the name of Robert Jaffrey, he walked away from his family fortune, and he helped open alliance work in nations that we now call China, Vietnam, and Indonesia. In China, during the Boxer Rebellion of the year 1900, 18 alliance missionaries and 13 of their children were martyred. But by 1967, the Alliance was delighted to have 18 congregations meeting through the growing city of Hong Kong. And today in Hong Kong, the Alliance has 116 churches that invest 11% of their annual income into sending out missionaries around the world. 
In one city in China, just in in recent uh, months, hundreds of young professionals have been coming to the Lord, being discipled in their faith, and many of them carry the dream of being sent out as missionaries themselves around the world. And I should just pause for a moment and let you guys know that when we're telling you something going on in one of these countries, we're just skimming the surface and telling you just a little bit about what's happening. In the country of Vietnam, during the 1968 Tet Offensive, seven Alliance missionaries were martyred. And all the remaining workers there were forced to evacuate, but still the gospel advanced. Today, the alliance in Vietnam is more than one million believers strong and is actually the largest Christian missionary alliance church in the world. In the the Philippines, there are half a million alliance believers in over 3,000 fellowships. In Indonesia, there are over 2,200 alliance congregations, and right now they have a strategy in the next couple of years to plant 20 new churches among the most overlooked people in Indonesia. In the country of Laos, Ted and Ruth Adrianoff were assigned to what was considered the most isolated missionary post in all of Indochina. Through their work, a local shaman, which is like a witch doctor, was the first person that they led to Jesus, and within six months, 2,000 people had accepted Christ. And today, the Hmong church, and a Hmong, that's called, that's a people group called the Hmong. The Hmong church is thriving in both the United States and Asia. In Japan, due to the depression, the Alliance actually closed that field in the year 1937. But a woman by the name of Mabel Francis, she said, no, I'm not gonna leave. And so she respectfully resigned from the Alliance and she stayed. And at the end of World War II, Mabel was there to welcome the Alliance back to her beloved country. And upon her retirement at the age of 83, Mabel received the highest civilian award that can be given by the Japanese government for her love and her commitment to the Japanese people. Yet sadly today, less than one half of 1% of the Japanese follow Jesus. Moving on to the Middle East. By faith, the Braden family arrived here in 1923. And George Braden often traveled by camel for hundreds of miles through open desert to preach the good news. And today there are more than 100 Alliance churches there that can trace their lineage back to their work, including in Iraq, where Jesus is the light of the world church shines bright in Baghdad. And in Jordan, where an Alliance church has developed a six-story community center that provides schooling for 162 Syrian refugee children. In Latin America, some of our earliest Alliance missionaries actually went to our Spanish and Portuguese-speaking countries uh, such as Peru, where despite a lot of pressure and a lot of danger, by faith they would establish these chains of evangelistic stations along major rivers. And you can see from these statistics that today the church in Peru is alive and vibrant. In Cuba, the Canadian and Peruvian Alliance helped launch new churches there in the 1990s. Today, there are now 72 Alliance churches in Cuba, and they have the goal of reaching 120 churches by the year 2020. Christ Community is actually the first church from the U.S. to partner with the Cuban church. Uh, Pictured here is a group of Alliance pastors from America that recently uh, visited churches in Cuba, and they're actually eating dinner on the roof of two new classrooms that are being built by funds that your children have been raising right here at Christ Community Church. And these classrooms are helping them reach children in the community and expand their, their reach into their community. Some people think that the church in Europe is dead, but our Alliance family is actually testifying that a new openness to the gospel is emerging. We're seeing new baptisms in Italy, new Christ followers in Spain as Alliance workers minister to immigrants from Syria and from North Africa. We have five churches in Germany where very few people attend a church of any kind. And there are signs of life being seen in France, such as at the Alliance's beautiful Genesis Center that reaches out to the younger generation. Last year in France, the Alliance had the joy of baptizing more people than in the previous six years combined. One more region, North and Central Asia. In Russia, during the 1990s, the Alliance quickly responded after the Iron Curtain fell, and today there are Alliance Christ followers worshiping in more than 50 churches. As conflict has arisen in the eastern Ukraine, a lot of the residents have been fleeing into the city of Kiev, where there happens to be Alliance workers there that are providing now groceries and basic necessities for many of these displaced people. 
Just 20 years ago, there were no Alliance churches in Mongolia, and in fact, that country was completely closed to missionary work. But today, we have teams there, and 30 new churches have been planted. Finally, it's exciting to tell you that we have terms, teams serving in places that we can't even tell you about. In a country with the code name Tea House, recently a second new believer from an unreached people group has come to faith. And in the country code named Long Beach, four baptisms were celebrated recently. According to our worker, these young people were running down the beach giddy with joy at the thing that they had just done. And in another place that we call Green Mountains, three groups meet regularly to study the Bible together. For many of them, this is the first time they've ever read the Word of God on their own. Well, we very quickly have taken you guys all around the world and given you some examples of Alliance work to unreached and overlooked people. But much like the author of Hebrews, we didn't have time to tell you of all of the amazing work in places like Angola and Argentina, Brazil, Cambodia, Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cote d'Ivoire, Dominican Republic, Ecuador, El Salvador, French Guiana, Ghana, Great Britain, and Guadeloupe, and Guatemala, and Haiti, Honduras, India, Israel, Kenya, Kosovo, Lebanon, Martinique, Mexico, Myanmar, Nepal, Niger, Panama, Paraguay, Portugal, South Korea, Taiwan, Thailand, Uruguay, Venezuela, and more than a dozen closed, closed access countries, or fin Fiji, Finland, New Zealand, Australia, Canada. All told today, the Alliance Worldwide consists of over 6.3 million believers worshiping in 180 languages in over 22,000 churches. So how would you answer Maggie's questions when she said, where will this lead? Has it been worth it? I hope you would say, like me, that it has been well worth it. In Christ Community Church, I want to encourage you to press on because what we're a part of matters. We are part of something that's so much bigger than ourselves that has life-changing impact around the world. So let's do this.
That's all that matters. And so God, I pray this morning that our hearts would be drawn out, that our truest selves, God, would be revealed and uniquely you would lead us into ways that we could express your love to this world. In the name of Jesus, amen. Well, there's no one or nothing like Jesus, is there? Not even a close second in my life, and I hope that's true for you guys as well. Well, hey, again, it's good to see you. My name is Brad. I get to serve as the high school pastor around here, and uh, as we continue our worship service, I wanna invite our ushers to come forward and begin passing the plates as they receive that offering. And whether you uh, give in person weekly or whether you give online, we wanna say thank you so much for your sacrificial giving. It makes a huge difference around here and in our city and around the world. And check this out, if you're new, we don't want you to feel any pressure to give. You can just pass those plates on by as they go, all right? Uh, speaking of those of you who are new, my guess is that there's quite a few new people here this morning, and we are really glad that you're here. In fact, let's welcome, let's give it up for all our new visitors who are here today. Yeah. And we wanna invite you back. And our hope is before you head out the doors this morning that we get a chance to meet you. And so that's why we have this really helpful next steps area it's set up just inside the main doors of our church where you can stop by and meet some new people, learn about our church, even pick up a free gift that we have for you, all right? Hey, this next announcement is for those of you who are kind of new or brand new around here, I wanna tell you about our foundations class. If you're interested in learning more about what we believe or who Jesus is, learning about baptism or how to become a member so you can get engaged even more at Crest Community Church, Foundations is for you. And uh, you can sign up for that class at that same Next Steps area uh, just inside the front doors of our church. We'd love to have you be a part of that class, all right? Well, hey, uh, as you've already been hearing throughout this amazing service already, this is On Mission Week, and uh, we don't just have a bunch of events to fill up your already busy calendar to waste your time, but we have a bunch of events because we want to inspire you to be on mission alongside of God and what he's doing in our city and world. And so I want to encourage you while I'm talking to go ahead and pull out this little thing that was inside that booklet that you were given when you came in. I want to highlight a few of the things that are going on this week that we would love for you to consider being a part of. Uh, one of those on the front there talks about the hand of Honor clothing drive that's happening, and you can read all about how you can be a part of that. And then if you flip it over, a few events that are going on. Uh, one of them is tonight in this very room. It's for you ladies and girls age 10 and up, and uh, we're gonna be learning about Hands of Honor and what they do that's uh, dramatically changing the lives of many, many girls in West Africa. Uh, there's gonna be a dinner provided free of charge. Uh, we just need you to sign up, and you can do that when you head out the doors at some of the sign-up booths that you'll see out there. Uh, so free 
free food, a great chance to get to meet some other people and hear what God is doing around the world. That's tonight at six for you women. All right, and then this Wednesday in the chapel, we get to uh, hear from Jake and we get to hear from Pastor Moise and Becky McCabe as they share about what God is doing around the world and then we get a chance to pray for them. That's Wednesday night. And then Saturday uh, coming up is our Meals for Molly. And we're gonna be packing up thousands of meals and we've got hundreds of you signed up already, but we still have a space for a few more. And so if you wanna uh, be a part of that, you can sign up for that as well. So you're like, Brad, how do I sign up for all these things? Yes, there's the info booths, booths the booths, the info booths, the info booths uh, that are here when you head out the doors in the back, but also you can go to cccomaha.org slash, been taking a little karate, uh, on mission. And uh, you can uh, just tell us that you're coming to any one of these things, again, especially for tonight for that food so they can be ready for you, all right? Well, hey, we're gonna head on to the message portion of our service here. Uh, if you're following us online, we're gonna send you to a little bit different message because what's happening live here has some sensitive information that's gonna be shared. And so if you're online, you're gonna get to hear a message from the president of our denomination, John Stumbo, all right? Well, hey, let's pray for that message here right now. God, we pray for these offerings that they would continue to be used by your mighty powerful hand to impact people all around the world, that we'd hear more stories of conversions and salvations through the faithful giving of your people. And we pray for this message that you would stir our hearts, that you would cause us not to just be hearers of your word, but doers of your word as we head out these doors a little bit later this morning. Empower us to do that through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, last time I was with you, I shared a story that I want to lead with today, kind of a link from last time to a launch to today. It's a story of a missionary in Africa who was passing out New Testaments. The Bible had been translated into yet another language, and he wanted to get the word out. And so he was giving away these New Testaments. They came across a rather hardened-looking individual who was sitting on the curb of the street smoking cigarettes that he was rolling up himself. And the missionary came by and offered him a Bible. And the man said, Mr., I don't know what book that is that you've got, but if you give me one of those, you need to know I'm just going to tear out the pages and roll them up and use them for my cigarettes. The missionary thought for a minute and said, well, will you make me a deal? <laughs> And guy said, what's that? Well, you promised me that you'll read every page before you smoke it. <coughs> the guy said, deal. The missionary didn't see that man for 15 years when he showed up at a church conference. The missionary did, sitting in the back of the conference. And up front, the speaker looked familiar to him. He thought, I think I've seen that guy before. And the speaker started to tell a story. I was sitting on a curb smoking the cigarettes that I was making. This missionary comes by, gives me a Bible, and uh, we make this deal. And so I kept my part of the deal. I smoked Matthew. <laughs> but I read every page as I did. I smoked Mark. <laughs> I smoked Luke. Uh, but when I got to John 3.16, something changed. You know what changed, church. For God so loves this world that he gave us his one and only son. That whoever, it doesn't matter who it is, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And once again, the gospel of Jesus Christ entered into a human soul. And he was changed by that and gave testimony. Friends, I delight in the fact, don't you, that the gospel of Jesus Christ is life-changing. I am the recipient of a changed life because of what Jesus did for me. The good news, that's what gospel means, right? Good news. And what news is better than the fact that the God of this universe actually loves the world that he created even though we've strayed from him and would show his love to us by bringing such things as forgiveness, grace, mercy, atonement into this world. It's, it's not only good news is the best news the gospel we have so I'm a grateful follower of Jesus Christ and and today what I want to do is give us four fuels 
for the fire of passion that burns in our hearts. Mark has said that we're part of one movement, so one, one family here called the Christian Missionary Alliance. And, and this, the theme of this message today, of this whole one, Power of One series, today the Power of One movement. Well, this movement that you're part of is fueled by a passion for the gospel, and I want to tell you what some of those fuels are, one of them being the fuel of... <sighs> Just the delight in the fact that the gospel changes lives. Uh, have any of you been to a high school or college graduation ceremony in the last 20 years? Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing we all heard the same speech. Let me see if you recognize this. I can do it in 20 seconds. Students, you have an unlimited reservoir of human potential to accomplish any dream, to overcome any obstacle. All you must do is believe in yourself, dig deeply within yourself, and you can accomplish anything in this world. Go, students. Have you heard that speech? All right. Well, <laughs> how is it working for you? <laughs> that believe in yourself. Maybe, maybe at 18 or sometime in your 20s, you think you have some unlimited reservoir of human potential. <clears throat> but you're going to wake up sometime about in your 30s and you're going to be tired. <laughs> Mark admitted to that last time. You still admit to it? <laughs> okay. And you're going to look in the, you're going to look in the mirror some morning and you're going to think, "Bummer." <laughs> If all I have is what I find in here, I'm in trouble. And I want to announce to America, yes, officially you are in trouble. If, if to face any obstacle or to overcome any challenge, all you have is what you find in yourself, you're in trouble not only for this life, but for the life to come. But those of us who are followers of Jesus Christ have a completely different message. On my deathbed, I was so glad that I didn't just have to look deeply within myself and try and find something in that ICU ward. No, 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 no. I am, I'm glad in life and death and everything in between that I have a Savior, I have a King, I have a Lord, I have a Master. I'm not on my own in this world. Isn't it wonderful? <laughs> <clears throat> the gospel of Jesus Christ is life-changing, and that gives fuel to our passion. Number two, another fuel, is that not everyone has access to this gospel. This is something we don't talk about enough in the church of the United States. But what we know about Jesus and what we have available to us through the Bible is not accessible to everyone. You do realize that this book is banned still in many countries in this world, that you're holding something illegal if you have this in some countries still. Not everyone has access to the gospel. Let me tell it this way. If you here in the United States <clears throat> wanted to meet somebody who had a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and you were bold enough to go knocking on doors, <clears throat> you'd have to knock on a door every 15 minutes for an hour and a half before you could find somebody who could tell you about Jesus. Depending on where you live in the country, it might vary a little bit, but basically, a knock on one door every 15 minutes, within an hour and a half, you could find somebody. In post-Christian Europe, where we have some workers that you've sent out through the Great Commission Fund, where there's only 2% evangelical Christian, you'd have to knock on a door every 15 minutes eight hours a day for a day and a half before you could find somebody who could tell you about a personal relationship with Jesus. But in the countries I'm talking about and among the people groups that I'm talking about that don't have access to the gospel, you would statistically have to knock on a door every 15 minutes, eight hours a day, 30 days a month, 365 days a year for three years before you could find somebody who has a relationship with Jesus. No church, no Bible, no Christians, no access. Friends, that grieves the family, the movement that you are part of. 
Our hearts are not content with the fact that you could live on this planet in this day and age and still have no way of knowing who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do. That for us is a fairness, a justice issue. It's not good enough that we know about Christ. We want everyone to be able to know about Christ. It's not fair. It's not right. It's not just that not everyone knows, that not everyone has the opportunity to know. And so that fuels our passion for the gospel, knowing that there's a lot of people who have no way of knowing about the gospel. Recently, uh, in one country that I will not name, some garbed women, because of the religion of their land, came at invitation to one of our international workers' homes and started to have a clandestine Bible study. They would meet secretly, quietly, in this home, study in the Bible, and recently, one of the women said to our international worker, I must not have understood your Arabic uh, correctly. You're still learning Arabic, and I, I must not have understood it because what you just said was that I could be forgiven of everything that I've ever done because of Jesus. Certainly, I misunderstood you. My international worker said, well, no, that's, that's exactly what I said, and that's exactly what the gospel is. But friends, think about this, church. There is somebody, there are some entire peoples, there are some entire nations where the concept of forgiveness is completely foreign, unknown, unrecognizable. Didn't know that that was possible. Didn't know that that's available. That's not right. That you could live in this world today and not know that forgiveness is available. New life. Number three. What fuels the passion that we have for the gospel to take the message of Jesus to the world? Here's a third. You might think it's an odd one at first. And I want to take you to Acts chapter 1. If you would open your Bibles, please. I want, excuse me. I want to give you the fastest tour of the book of Acts you've ever had, at least the first 11 chapters. And uh, let's start in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts 1, 8. Some of you know this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, the town where they were right at the time, in Judea, their surrounding area, kind of like their county, Samaria, people close to them who were not like them, language, cultural kind of differences, and to the ends of the earth. Anywhere that there's people. So what this verse is doing is giving us the empowerment. We don't have to create this on our own. No, the Holy Spirit comes to give us the power to do what he wants us to do. And the assignment. I want you to take the gospel to every segment of human society. Start where you are. Start in Jerusalem, but don't get stuck there. Well, my question is, how did they do? Right here in the book of Acts. Have you ever asked this question? Did they, did they do it? Jesus was really clear. These were his last words to them. This is my assignment to you guys. How'd they do? Well, let's look real quick. Acts chapter 2, we find out that Jesus does his part. You know Acts 2, right? Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit. There's people there. If you look down in verse 9 and 10 and don't recognize those nations, they've come from the entire region, Iraq, Iran, Turkey, North Africa. They've come, and they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, and verse 41 of chapter 2 says that 3,000 people come to Christ that day. Fantastic. The Holy Spirit's come, the empowerment part, the assignment, Jerusalem, wow, great start, 3,000 people already. What happens next? What about Judea, Samaria, uttermost parts of the world? Well, you get to uh, chapter 2, verse 46, and you read this. Every day, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. Well, they were doing good stuff, but, but where were the temple courts? Where were they? What's it? Jerusalem. Yes, thank you. All right. So they're still in town. Well, it's just chapter two, so I guess we're all right. Chapter three, all oh, cool stuff starts happening. It's not only Jesus that did miracles. Now the disciples are doing miracles, and Peter preaches a fantastic sermon, but it's all right there in Jerusalem. Chapter four. 
A little bit of trouble starts to come. The uh, local authorities don't like the fact that they killed Jesus, but now the disciples are doing the same work. And so the disciples have a prayer meeting, and that's all good, but it's right there in Jerusalem. <laughs> Chapter 5. Uh-oh, this is not a happy one. Note to self, don't lie to a spirit-filled apostle like the disciples were because you're going to have an appointment with God face-to-face -face a lot faster than you thought you were going to. And uh, so there's interesting things that happen in the church in Jerusalem. Chapter 6. Oh, this is a good chapter because the leaders realize we're doing way too much work. We're overwhelmed. We need to give ourselves the word of God in prayer. And so let's get some help. And so they recruit some help for the church in Jerusalem. Okay, you're getting the point. Great. Thank you for following me. Chapter 7. Uh, I'm going to share tonight at 6 o'clock about the first martyr that we've had under my leadership uh, in the last two years. Well, here's the first martyr that is for the Christian church to have in history. Stephen is uh, stoned for his faith in Christ there in Jerusalem. In chapter 8, verse 1, would you look with me? 8-1. On that day of the persecution of Stephen... A great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. For the first time in eight chapters, since 1-8, we read in 8-1 those words, Judea and Samaria. They're finally getting out of town. The assignment that was giving to, given to them in 1-8 became the agenda of 8-1. And in verse 4, just so that we're clear, 8-4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went throughout Judea and Samaria. So fantastic. Because this wasn't an either-or kind of assignment that Jesus gave them. Either you guys stay here, or you go there, or you go there. No, 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 no. This was a both and, and, and assignment. I want you to take my message to every segment of human society. And it take, took them eight chapters just to get out of Jerusalem. And now, how about the ends of the earth? We only got to Judea and Samaria. We got to get all the way to chapter 11. And the author, Luke, is very careful how he presents this. 11.19, last verse I'll have you look at. 11.19. Those who had been scattered by the persecution in connection with Stephen, that's what we just read, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, at first only telling the message to Jews, but then finally sharing the message with everybody. And it took them 11 chapters, according to some scholars, three years to finally get around to doing what they'd been called to do. What the church was unwilling to do in a time of prosperity, they finally do in a time of persecution. Opposition became an opportunity for the gospel to advance. Friends, I could give you 20 points on this fuel kind of message, what fuels our passion, but I chose this one out of a long list today because you and I watch the same news, right? Does it not get a little depressing these days to watch what's going on in this world? Just think of the last year alone. <clears throat> Tensions on the streets of Ferguson. Tensions between Russia and the Ukraine. ISIS marching across the Middle East. Ebola marching across Africa. <coughs> Hard stories. What the news doesn't tell us <laughs> is that the gospel is advancing in every one of those stories. And you are part of that because the Christian Missionary Alliance, this movement that you're a part of, is in every one of those locations, bringing the hope and love of Jesus in those places. The, the gospel is advancing in spite of opposition. So much of the world today is in turmoil, but <laughs> did you know this? Because of the generosity of some of your parents that went to this church like 50 years ago, we have 18 sister churches. You do. You have 18 sister churches in Syria. 
Yes, the country that's on the news all the time with ISIS blowing the whole thing up and the country with millions of refugees. You have 18 sister churches. Imagine if, if Christ Community Church, if half the congregation no longer lived in Omaha or the United States of America because you fled for your lives and those who were poor stayed behind because they couldn't get out of the country. But the church, just as full today as it was a couple years ago because of all the people coming to find out about Christ. Baptisms are taking place in Syria. Ordination of new church leaders are taking place in Syria. I love that. Just across the border in a country that I won't name, you have a sister church of 85 people. A little congregation that's been faithful through the decades and was, we're praying, Lord, how do we reach more people for Christ? Just like you guys pray here at Christ Community Church. How do we reach more people? Well, the Civil War across the border takes place. Their country is stable, but they suddenly have waves and waves of refugees pouring into their town. This little Alliance Church of 85 people starts reaching out, giving away mattresses, giving away food, helping people, sharing the name of Jesus, doing some post-traumatic stress kind of counseling. Fabulous ministry. 4,500 families have been ministered to by that little church just in the last few years. <laughs> Very quick. Missions done poorly doesn't understand the local context and culture. The mission is done poorly. It's not incarnational. It's easy to raise money for stuff in the United States of America. We can raise money for stuff all day long. So, it's a true story. Whole semi-truck fills up full of mattresses purchased by American generosity to be given to Syrian refugees. But because that missions agency doesn't understand the language of the culture or the situation, men and boys rush the truck, women and children pushed aside, all the mattresses are taken, and later that week they're for sale down at a local store. That's missions done poorly. Meanwhile, this little Alliance Church of 85 people knows the language, knows the culture, knows the situation, and blesses the people, 4,500 families worth of mattresses, distributed one at a time in the name of Jesus. <laughs> Completely different scenario. All right. I'm talking about the gospel advancing in spite of opposition. You have sister churches <laughs> throughout these war-torn areas. There are salvations happening in Iraq. There's a million believers that ro rose out of the ashes of the Vietnam War. A million. <laughs> and on the list goes one quick personal story. I'll just call the man Wa. Wa was living in Iraq with his, hus with his uh, wife and daughter. They were trapped inside their own home because of the violence of the city around them, and they ran out of food. Days went by. They couldn't leave their home, had no access to food. Finally, it seems to quiet down, and so the wife and daughter plead with the husband, we know that you as a man can't go in the streets, but maybe we can get away with it and go get some food. He allows them to no more. Do they step out of the door when he hears pop, 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 pop and a scream from a neighbor, and he looks outside, and his wife and daughter are laying in their own blood. He rushes out to hold them in their final breaths as he then is bludgeoned with a heavy metal uh, club of some kind. <coughs> and he wakes up in the morgue with dead bodies all around him. And he says, I'm not dead, I'm not dead. He was released, but he was angry to the core. This man from that Middle Eastern culture was going to get revenge on that group that had killed his wife and daughter. That was his life goal, to get revenge. He immigrated to another country where he met one of our alliance teammates who invited him to a Christmas celebration where he found out about Jesus and the real story of Jesus. And just this Easter, Wa was baptized as a follower of Jesus Christ with a very clear testimony that he no longer needed to seek revenge. He was offering forgiveness. We'll probably tell more of those stories tonight, but I need to hasten on to the last point. Why, what fuels our passion for the gospel? <laughs> well, the gospel changes lives. That not everyone has access to the gospel. The gospel is inviting, is, is advancing in spite of opposition. And lastly, 
what fuels our passion for the gospel is that it advances more powerfully when we work together. I love this. See, if I were to ask Christ Community Church, even though you're a large church, one of the largest of, of our Alliance family, if I were to ask you to do really well at reaching your Jerusalem, Omaha, your surrounding area, your Samaria, and all the way to the ends of the earth, not just one country, but multiple countries with a sound missiological strategy. By that, I mean doing missions well rather than missions poorly. If I were to ask you as a single church to have all of those done well consistently through you as a local church, I'd be putting a heavy burden on you and your pastor. Would you want to be that pastor, Mark? <laughs> and so, but I'm not doing that. And the New Testament isn't doing that. What the New Testament calls us to do is work together. The power of the Church of Christ in multiple occasions working together for a greater advancement of the kingdom. We really are better together. So I'm not asking you to do this individually. I'm, I am asking you to join together with 2,000 other churches here in the United States and 20,000 around the world to work together and bring the love and name of Jesus to the least reached places of this world. And together, this is achievable. What one thing that fuels our advance, uh, our passion for the gospel is that the gospel is advancing as we work together. And here's where I need to look you in the eye, especially those of you who are faithful to this church and leaders in this church, and say a sincere thank you as the president of the Christian Missionary Alliance. Not just during my time, but for decades, this church has been a leader of leaders. You have been an example to the examples. You've been a model to the models. I can't overstate the significance of Christ Community Church's impact on this entire planet because of your faithful, steady, generous, wise, strategic, passionate kind of consistent giving and, and sending and praying and gathering and putting together packets of food and on and on and on the list goes. You guys are a leader of the leaders. And I'm curious to see where this is going to continue to go in the life and ministry of this church. Would it be possible that Christ Community Church would be the first church in Alliance history to ever give $2 million a year to the Great Commission Fund? I don't know. I'm just curious. And I know that a fund isn't flashy. I, I get that. But people give to funds all the time. This church is operated by a fund, a general fund. That's what keeps the lights on and the staff paid and, and the ministry is going forward and the outreach of the community. And, and for crying out loud, we're in the shadow of a merit trade where, where funds are like a really big deal, mutual funds. And if you have been confused about the Great Commission Fund, let me simply say that as a Ameritrade Mutual Fund allows you to simultaneously invest in, a multiple, in multiple stocks or bonds. Even if you only got 100 bucks, you can be invested in multiple stocks and funds. So it is with the Great Commission Fund. In a mutual fund kind of way, we are simultaneously investing in every place that the Alliance team is working. I like that. I don't have to pick and choose. Oh, I sure wish I could give to that, but I don't have enough money to give to that and that and that. Well, with this centralized funding system, you do. We get to give to it all simultaneously. So every story that I've told you today and every story I'm going to tell you tonight, you've been part of if you've contributed uh, to the Great Commission Fund. So it's, it's really fun for me. <laughs> and it's fun for me to be able to stand here and say to you that you are making a massive contribution for the advancement of the gospel in this world. You really can reach the world from Omaha, Nebraska, and you're proving that week in, week out, church. You know, I said missions done poorly um, doesn't understand local culture and all that kind of thing. One, one more statement. Missions done poorly creates Western dependence. Do you know what I mean by that? We create a scenario where people on the receiving side just continue to be on the receiving side and never are able to, to graduate to the place of being able to support their own church and support their own pastor and, and feed themselves and, and lead themselves and educate themselves. <laughs> we're, we're about ready to bless 
Carolyn, who spent 40 years training nurses so that they in Africa could be blessing and ministering and nursing the, the locals themselves. Rather than a system where we continue to send waves and waves of more nurses, let's just train the locals that are there. This is what the Alliance has done. So you know that when a church that you've planted in another, among another people group, you know that church is fully mature when it not only is supporting itself, don't need outside funds, governing itself, don't need outside leadership, educating itself, have their own colleges and seminary, but you know it's fully graduated when they are become a mission sending church. Now the place in which, to which we originally sent missionaries now are sending their own missionaries. You have been part of a family that has multiplied itself 22 times over. That's how many national churches now are mission-sending churches in this movement called the Alliance. That's cool. That's fun. Friends, uh, I'll, I'll share more stories and pictures tonight and answer whatever questions you have, but, but for this moment... Can I say this? I believe with all my heart that the Alliance, this movement that you're part of, is one of God's end times families that he has raised up to complete the Great Commission. Did you hear that? You are part of one of God's end times families that he raised up at this late day of human history to finish the Great Commission. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached as a testimony to all the peoples and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. No, please, please, Christ Community Church, if I fail on this, I have failed today. Please hear me say this. What you're doing matters. It's a huge investment in the kingdom. What you're doing matters to that oppressed woman who had never heard of forgiveness, to that embittered refugee who went from revenge to repentance. What you're doing matters to the million people that have been baptized into the name of Jesus in just the last five years alone. You heard me right. 1.2 million people that have been baptized in the name of Jesus, not in the name of the Christian Missionary Alliance. We don't do that. No, no. We're baptizing in the name above all all names, the name Jesus, and you've been part of 1.2 million stories just in the last five years. This is what you're part of, and the best is yet to come. <laughs> We're poised to be able to even accomplish more for the kingdom of Christ in this world. Thank you for letting me speak to you today. Thank you for joining me in this mission that matters. God bless you. Thank you for joining us today online. Hopefully you have a fuller picture of all that God is doing through CCC and the Christian Missionary Alliance to bring the gospel to the least reached places of the world. If you're in the Omaha area, we invite you to take a look at cccomaha.org onmission to see all of the events throughout the week. God bless.